ओके सो वेलकम एवरीबडी आई एम डॉक्टर स्वालिया मुजावर किड भाई एंड वी आर कंटिन्यूइंग विद द लेक्चर सीरीज ऑन बाइपोलर मूड डिसऑर्डर्स दिस इज द पार्ट टू इन द फर्स्ट पार्ट वी हैड डिस्कस्ड अबाउट द क्लासिफिकेशन एंड क्लिनिकल फीचर्स इन क्लिनिकल फीचर्स वी हैड सीन द टू पोल्स मेनिया एंड डिप्रेशन and today we'll cover the etiology and treatment part of it so etiology or the causes of bipolar mood disorders this is very important not just from a theoretical point of view but because patients will come and ask their relatives will come and ask why did we develop this mental illness or what is the cause for mental illness and there are a lot of myths and misconceptions especially uh in our country uh, patients and relatives feel that it is due to some black magic or some other uh, entity which is giving rise to these illnesses so knowing the cause is very important there are a few theories which explain the cause for bipolarity the common one is a biological theory and there are a lot of psychosocial theories also so let us dive into these there are a lot of biological theories we'll look into them one by one there is a genetic hypothesis biochemical hypothesis neuroendocrinological changes are seen then brain imaging also has shown a lot of changes in patients with bipolarity so we'll be looking into these one by one first is a genetic hypothesis so yes a lot of genes have been identified which uh, lead towards the cause of bipolarity but unfortunately there is no single gene that has been identified multiple genes or a mixture of genes uh, may lead to bipolarity but it was seen that if there is a relative in the family or somebody in the family has bipolar mood disorder then there are chances of getting bipolarity so if there is a first degree relative then the chances are 25% for developing bipolarity and 20% chances of developing recurrent depressive disorder the chances of developing uh, these illnesses increase with the number of relatives and the closeness of relatives like first degree relatives the risk will be higher but if there's a second degree relative the risk will be comparatively low and another point is the incidence of these illnesses in children because your patients will come and they'll say that i'm getting married or i'm uh, thinking of having children so what are the chances that my children will uh, get these illnesses so lifetime risk for children with one parent is approximately 27% but if both the parents have bipolar mood disorder then the chances of the child having bipolar mood disorder goes up to 75% so counseling the patient or telling the patient about these chances is very very important because it is a genetic illness there is a risk if there is genetic loading then the risk does increase so explaining these two patients is very very important from practical point of view then there are some bio chemical theories also so just remember that your brain has a lot of bio chemicals or chemicals uh, which the brain uses to interact with each other or communicate with each other these biochemicals are known as neurotransmitters from psychiatry point of view the neurotransmitters which are important are called as monoamines the monoamines are your serotonin and catecholamines in catecholamines there are three types dopamine adrenaline and noradrenaline so if these neurotransmitters are abnormal then it can lead to bipolar symptoms so in depression what is seen is serotonin is very less 
this is the most common neurotransmitter which is involved but in depression other neurotransmitters like dopamine adrenaline noradrenaline are also decreased and of course in mania the opposite occurs that is there is increase in noradrenaline there is increase in dopamine and as you can see in this diagram uh, there is a presynaptic membrane and a postsynaptic membrane inside the synapse there is increase in these neurotransmitters which gives rise to the symptoms of bipolar mood disorder so remember these neurotransmitters because this will help us in our treatment also so whatever treatment uh, will focus will be focusing on these neurotransmitters so biochemical uh, point of view or biochemical theories are very very important then sometimes uh, acetylcholine and gaba are also abnormal and a lot of other neurotransmitters are also being uh, researched and developed so we are coming to know newer and newer neurotransmitters which are involved but uh, at least uh, remember the main ones the serotonin and catecholamines acetylcholine and gaba can also be abnormal and involved in these illnesses then coming to neuroendocrinological theories so it was seen that some endocrine abnormalities are also seen in patients of bipolarity the endocrine abnormalities can be mostly hypo or hyperthyroidism cushing's disease addison's disease so thyroid hormones uh, corticosteroids and other hormones are also abnormal uh, in uh, bipolar mood disorder so abnormal levels are seen like in depression there is abnormality in dexamethasone suppression test so definitely uh, there is some correlation between these endocrinological abnormalities and the symptoms of bipolarity so always keep in mind uh, that there can be some endocrinological disorder always uh, say uh, thyroid function test always send corticosteroid levels also this will help us in our uh, treatment and uh, further management then brain imaging so a lot of interesting uh, things were found in brain imaging when uh, this was done so ct mri pet scan spectroscopic scan was done of patients of bipolar mood disorder and then these scans were compared to normal people so what was seen was that ct and mri scans of normal people and bipolar uh, patients suffering from bipolar mood disorder was very very different so there was a lot of differences or there was a lot of abnormalities found on these a lot of structural abnormalities a lot of functional abnormalities because the pet scan and spec scan will see the functional changes the mri and ct scan will see the structural changes so both structural and functional abnormalities were seen for example a pet scan for serotonin was done and a pet scan for serotonin in healthy individual will uh, show some changes in the prefrontal cortex uh, some changes in the temporal and occipital lobe are also seen so glucose metabolism is basically the underlying phenomena which is measured so in healthy people there are some areas which are lit up but in depressed patient you can see uh, there is decreased blood flow there is decreased glucose metabolism so there is no uh, lighting up or there are uh, no areas of metabolism which are seen so definitely there is a abnormality in glucose metabolism also in manic or in a, a patients suffering from mania opposite will be seen so if a healthy patient and a, a manic patient is compared there will be a lot of uh, lighting up of uh, areas seen the manic patient will see a lot of changes in especially prefrontal cortex there will be a lot of lighting up of areas so uh, pet scan abnormalities are also seen in patients 
this shows that there is some structural and functional abnormality now let us look at psychosocial theories so some psychoanalytical theories say that childhood adverse experiences some stressors can also lead to uh, bipolarity or they might precipitate bipolarity which might then become a lifelong illnesses so these are also some theories uh, which are accepted for specifically for depression there are some theories the most common and uh, frequently accepted is the cognitive behavioral therapy this was given by arent beck and this theory says that there are some depressive or negative cognitions or negative thoughts which lead to depression and focusing on these thoughts will help in treatment also so cbt or cognitive behavior therapy is a very important theory for development of depression another theory says that there is learned helplessness this is basically a animal model so rat studies or animal uh, studies were seen and they showed that uh, when there was repeated failures or repeated helplessness was there then the uh, animals in those studies developed depression or uh, symptoms similar to depression so they uh, like they try to prove that a learned helplessness also leads to depression then some psychosocial theories also say that uh, patients are not able to express anger uh, outside and this anger is turned inwards and this anger turned inwards again leads to development of symptoms of depression so these are some psychosocial theories which are specifically uh, there for depression now let us go to the management management can be divided into two somatic and psychosocial so in somatic we will first see a uh, somatic treatment for depression which is basically antidepressants and some other treatments like electroconvulsive therapy or ect for mania we have lithium we have antipsychotics we have other mood stabilizers also so first let us look at antidepressants so in your pharmacology lectures also you might have gone through these list of antidepressants the older antidepressants were monoamine oxidase inhibitors or mao inhibitors but these mao inhibitors had a lot of side effects the most common one is the cheese reaction or the tyramine reaction which was a potentially life threatening reaction so now these uh, drugs are hardly ever used tricyclic antidepressants were developed due to the side effects of mao inhibitors but uh, now it was seen that the tricyclic antidepressants also had a lot of anticholinergic side effects there was a lot of sedation also so then ssris were developed these are the most commonly used uh, drugs and in our opd in our wards also ssris are the ones which we very commonly use because of the favorable side effect profile then other newer antidepressants also you should know so bupropion trazodone venlafaxin metazepine nafazadone these are the newer antidepressants which are also used but always always remember whenever you prescribe antidepressants to any patients the antidepressants take 3 at least 3 weeks for their effects to come so you will have to counsel the patient that uh, see these symptoms will not get relieved immediately after taking medicines you might have to take them for a few weeks after which the improvement in symptoms will be seen so always remember to just wait and watch for the response of antidepressants and of course look at the side effect also mechanism of action of antidepressants monoamine actions are there so there will be increase in monoamines increase in 
norepinephrine increase in serotonin and also uh, inhibition of catabolism like mao inhibitors mao was the enzyme which was responsible for catabolism so if we inhibit the mao enzyme the catabolism is inhibited and there is increase in all these neurotransmitters ssris tcas venla vaccine these antidepressants act by inhibiting the reuptake so reuptake is inhibited again the neurotransmitters are increased in the synapse some antidepressants have a direct agonism or antagonism especially the newer ones are direct acting antidepressants so just have an idea about the mechanism of action also uh, just if you have to remember one thing just remember that antidepressants are increasing your norepinephrine serotonin and catecholamines and your monoamines now we have uh, looked at a long list of antidepressants which are available so how will we uh, decide which antidepressant to use which is the best which is the fastest antidepressant mostly this decision is taken upon the previous response so if the patient has a past history of response to a particular antidepressant for example patient will come and uh, tell you that i had taken escitalopram in the past and i all my depressed of symptoms all my depression was relieved with uh, escitalopram so then definitely you will think of adding escitalopram as an antidepressant because previously also patient had recovered with this drug also family history is very important so if the patient has a, a parent or a grandparent who was prescribed uh, amitriptyline and the uh, a grandparent or parent had improved with that particular drug then again you will think of adding the same drug because the patient might also have a similar response so a very important factor is the predictor of response based on the past history or based on the family history of the patient and most antidepressants will have similar effect or their effectiveness is very very similar but their side effects are very different so major difference in all the antidepressants is the side effect so remembering the effects is very important remembering the side effects is equally important for example a particular antidepressant has a side effect of sedation like mirtazapine or tricyclic antidepressants or paroxetine also is a very sedating antidepressant but if the patient has decreased sleep which is a part of depression or which is a part of symptom of depression then prescribing a depression uh, de antidepressant which is a sedative will uh, be actually beneficial but if a patient is uh, working if a patient is uh, uh, not having uh, decreased sleep if the patient says that i am feeling very lethargic or i am uh, as a part of his depression he says that i don't feel like doing anything i feel very uh, lazy throughout the day then you will give uh, antidepressants which are a bit activating or which might not cause sedation so that is why side effects are also very very important in deciding which antidepressant to choose so taking all these factors into country consideration we will choose one antidepressant and we will prescribe it accordingly now coming to a very very uh, interesting phenomena of electroconvulsive therapy or ect so ect uh, you might have seen in your movies or tv series uh, mostly in a horror uh, sector or horror phenomena in which the patient is screaming there is a dungeon in which all these things are taking place so this is not how ect occurs ect is done in a clinical setup as you can see this is a ect machine ect is done under general anesthesia 
and ECT done under general anesthesia is called as modified ECT. So now days we always give modified ECT. ECT without anesthesia is not given. So whenever electroconvulsive therapy is given, the patient is under sedation. There is no pain to the patient. Patient hardly remembers anything. So it is a very painless procedure. There is no psychological or physical trauma to the patient. And in some cases, ECT may be the best uh, therapy or the best option available, especially if there is medication failure. So don't think that ECT is like the ones which is shown in a TV series or movies. It is a very clinical procedure done in OT or done in our wards or clinics. And it is given in patients with uh, really serious depression or severe depression. Or sometimes uh, it is a time sensitive phenomena because as you know, antidepressants take at least three weeks to act. But if the patient says or if you feel that the uh, recovery should be very fast, then again, ECT is a very good option. But then again, why don't we give ECT to everybody? Because one, uh, it has a very, uh, again, bad or negative connotation attached to it. Whenever you say that the patient should be given ECT, the patient and the relatives, are very skeptical they are not very uh, easily uh, uh, they are very easily convinced and also we need a general anesthesia setup or proper setup to give ect so these are the reasons why ect is not given but you should remember the indications for ect or the <sighs> clinical scenario where ect is definitely given so the most an absolute indication for ECT is severe depression with suicidal risk. So in a patient who is actively suicidal, then definitely ECT is the treatment of choice. Sometimes severe depression with stupor, with severe psychomotor retardation or somatic syndrome, these are also cases in which ECT is given. Sometimes a depression may present with psychotic symptoms also. So delusional depression or depression with psychotic symptoms also are, uh, are candidates for ECT. In treatment uh, resistant depression or severe treatment refractory depression, ECT is a choice. Sometimes the patient is not able to tolerate the side effects of antidepressants. So these are again uh, clinical scenarios in which ECT can be a treatment of choice. So just remember the indications of ECT. These are the scenarios where ECT is definitely uh, given or at least uh, told to the patient and is a very effective treatment. Then there are a lot of newer treatments also available apart from ECT. Other biological or somatic treatments are your transcranial magnetic stimulation and vagal nerve stimulation. So as you can see, uh, the right hand side picture shows your RTMS. So transcranial magnetic stimulation means a coil is held uh, above the head of the patient. This coil will give rise to magnetic changes occurring in the brain. Magnetic changes will lead to electrical changes in the brain. Electrical changes will lead to chemical changes. And these chemical changes are your underlying, uh, again, serotonin and catecholamine. So by giving transcranial magnetic stimulation, we are again leading to chemical changes inside the brain, especially the dors dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and the parietal lobe are the regions where we focus the magnetic stimulation. Sometimes in resistant cases, vagal nerve stimula stimulation can also be given. And these are, again, the indications are very similar to indications of ECT. That is when uh, medicines or antidepressants don't work, then in these cases, we can give RTMS and vagal nerve stimulation also. Okay, so this was treatment for depression. 
now treatment for mania in mania we have three main treatments lithium antipsychotic and anticonvulsant lithium is our time tested uh, drug this has been used since the past 50 years it's the first line treatment of mania one of the best treatments for mania and just like antidepressants take a few weeks to act even lithium will take a few weeks to act the most important thing which comes to your mind whenever you read lithium is the therapeutic index i'll be discussing this in detail in the next slide but the concern is a lot of side effects which occur with lithium the common side effect is your tremors uh it cannot be given in pregnancy because of teratogenic side effects so even though lithium has a lot of side effects uh it is still the best line of treatment for acute mania and for prevention of future episodes of mania also now what was this therapeutic index which we were talking about so whenever we give lithium at 900 to 1500 mg whenever we give these uh, uh drugs or whenever we give a lithium in therapeutic level also a uh, toxic level of lithium can be very easily attained like for example the therapeutic blood level is around 0.8 to 1.2 even for prophylaxis 0.6 to 1.2 milliequivalent per liter of lithium is required but if the blood level of lithium goes above 2 then toxicity occurs and 2.5 to 3 can also be lethal so when you look at this the therapeutic level and the toxic level is very very close this is known as a narrow therapeutic index so that is why uh, we need to closely monitor the lithium levels we need to closely uh, monitor the blood levels of lithium and the difference between the therapeutic level and the lithium uh, the lethal levels is very very narrow so that is why lithium is sometimes not prescribed by a lot of clinicians because uh, if the the level or the toxic levels are reached then sometimes we need to do dialysis also and again a life threatening situation might occur so this is the only uh, negative point about lithium that it has a very narrow therapeutic index we have to repeatedly send the blood levels and repeatedly check the lithium levels inside the patient so always remember whenever you are discussing lithium the narrow therapeutic index always comes into discussion now anticonvulsants so if lithium cannot be given it was seen that all other anticonvulsants also act as mood stabilizers so one mood stabilizer is lithium the other mood stabilizer are your all anticonvulsants so anticonvulsants like sodium valproate carbamazepine lamotrigine gabapentin all these anticonvulsants can also act as antimanic drugs and antidepressant drugs also especially lamotrigine mostly works as an antidepressant valproate carbamazepine oxcarbazepine uh, these are mostly antimanic drugs these can be used again for acute and prevention of future manic episodes and uh, these drugs also have side effects like sodium valproate has uh, your liver toxicity carbamazepine causes rashes lamotrigine also causes rashes gabapentin has a lot of sedation so just like all other medicines these drugs also have some side effects so always remember the side effect profile of all the medicines whenever you are prescribing any drug always remember side effects and taking into consideration 
the side effects the symptoms of the patient we dis, uh, we prescribe the anti convulsant drug now next is your anti psychotic since all mood stabilizers take at least a few weeks to act sometimes we can give anti psychotics as a add on drug especially for behavioral control or control of irritability which is very commonly seen in uh, patients of mania so atypical antipsychotics like olanzapine or classical antipsychotics like haloperidol trifluoxetine can also be effective uh, they can be they are mostly given early in the treatment but they can be given late also olanzapine also has has some mood stabilizing effect so lanzapin can actually be uh, given as a maintenance treatment also and uh, the side effect profile of antipsychotics you must have read but let's just revise that extrapyramidal side effects or extrapyramidal symptoms can occur especially with the classical or first generation antipsychotics neuroleptic malignant syndrome is again a life threatening side effect which you should remember tardive dyskinesia hyperprolactinemia sedation orthostatic hypotension dizziness drowsiness are again very common side effects weight gain especially with your second generation antipsychotics because metabolic side effects can occur so increased weight or uh, abnormal glucose metabolism increase in lipids are very very important things that you should keep in mind especially when prescribing antipsychotics to younger people always measure the body mass index the waist circumference keep monitoring the fasting glucose the lipid profile of the patient also look at development of some abnormal involuntary movements also uh, get an uh, ecg done if there is a family or personal history of any cardiac problems which have occurred in the patient so these are some points which you should always keep in mind when you are prescribing antipsychotics especially in a patient with mania now what are the psychosocial treatments which are available we have cognitive behavior therapy which is the most common and very uh, frequently prescribed therapy you can uh, prescribe interpersonal therapy psychoanalytic psychotherapy and behavior therapy also sometimes group therapy and familial and marital therapy can also be used so at individual level uh, we have cbt interpersonal therapy psychoanalytic and behavior therapy at uh, group level you can do group therapy so as you can see in this diagram the patients uh, sit in a circle most of them are patients suffering from mania or who have recovered from mania and uh, they just uh, they uh, discuss the problems that they faced or how they overcome these problems and uh, they feel nice that uh, there are other people also suffering so there is a sense of belonging also so group therapy always helps patients sometimes a lot of marital problems occur due to the symptoms of mania or uh, they might increase the symptoms of mania a lot of marital problems are also there so familial and marital therapy also helps in these patients so whenever you feel that these problems are occurring uh, the therapy should be prescribed accordingly last but not the least treatment of sleep problems is very very important in both depression and mania and in fact uh, i think you can uh, use this for your day to day life also because sleep problems are occurring very very commonly in everybody so remember these are some points which are known as sleep hygiene which you can help uh, which you can prescribe or give as a help for patient who has sleep problem so tell them to maintain a regular sleep routine so the time to go to sleep and time to wake up should be fixed a uh, 
maintenance of regular sleep schedule is very very important avoiding daytime naps is very important because if they sleep during the day they won't sleep during the night and the whole cycle gets uh, disturbed tell them that if they are not able to sleep they should not stay in bed for more than 10 to 15 minutes they should uh, go to a chair or go to some place else watching tv watching a mobile should not be recommended at all if they want to do something they can read a book uh, that is one of the best things that you, uh, they can do so just before they can uh, go to sleep avoiding substances that interfere with sleep like caffeine cigarettes alcohol or some over the counter medication which contain caffeine and other stimulants should be avoided if they have to take tea coffee cigarettes they should be told to take it before 5 o'clock after 5 o'clock or late in the evening if they take again their sleep will be hampered exercise again if they have to do it should be done early in the morning not just before bed then having a quiet comfortable uh, bedroom and a pre bedtime routine which is very comfortable uh, drinking milk or having a hot shower before bed should be prescribed so these are some uh, points which you can just tell in the patient which they can use to get a proper sleep schedule also so with this we finish the treatment uh, part which we have seen in the form of somatic symptoms and psychoanalytical uh, and other therapies which can be used and some uh, points for sleep also okay so thank you so much for listening